Texas, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Kayode Otikiolu. Tonight, the Nigerian Immigration Service intercepts 33 alleged illegal migrants from Chad and Togo in Odeda local government area of Ogun State. PDP presidential candidate Mr. Atiku Abubakar threatens to name and prosecute oil thieves if elected as he meets with business leaders in Lagos. He replies his APC counterpart on his quest for the presidency. The Sultan of Sokoto challenges the new leadership of Nieti Ala Cattle Breeders Association to help government find solutions to banditry and kidnapping. And a number of people feared dead as landslide triggered by heavy rains tears through Italian island of Ischia. On business news tonight, Nigeria's forex reserves declined by $10.97 million week on week to $37.18 billion. That's the lowest level since September 2021. And on sports news tonight, France become the first team to qualify for the last 16 of the 2022 World Cup as Kylian Mbappe's double sends the defending champions to a 2-1 win over Denmark. Thirty-three suspected illegal migrants from the Republic of Chad and Togo have been intercepted by the Nigeria Immigration Service in Odeda local government area of Ogun State. Parading the suspects at the command's office in Abeokuta, the state capital, the State Controller of Immigration, Yakubu Jibrin, says they were without valid travel documents and had no means of livelihood. Some people in the town, that's around Alugube Meta area, Shobri area, of the presence of some nationals. And these nationals were confirmed to be, they cannot interact with any other language than the French language. So after receiving that information, that was on the 7th of November, I decided to send my people there for surveillance, which they did for some days, just to confirm the genesis of that information. And uh, luckily for us, on Wednesday, by zero zero hours, we strike to that uh, location, the two locations that was assumed to be occupied by these people. And uh, we were able to apprehend 33 of them. We brought them here to this command, and uh, we started profiling them. So on investigation, or after profiling them, we discovered that out of these 33 of them, 32 are Chadian nationals, while only one of them is a Togolese. So, so we try to find out why these people are here and also from the same country. Uh, what they told us that uh, they were invited by the Togolese uh, to do networking business. They have to register. After registration, and I think they have to pay some amount of money for that registration, and uh, every week their account will be funded. We tried to see the type of products this Douglas, whom he claimed uh, they, they, he recruited them for a business, and uh, to be frank, he cannot show us anything. And to politics, the PDP presidential flag bearer, Mr. Tiko Abubakar, has threatened to name and prosecute those involved in oil theft in the country if elected president. Speaking during a meeting with some business leaders in Lagos today, he promised to confiscate oil blocks allocated to some Nigerians who have failed to make them operational, while reiterating his pledge to privatize refineries in Kaduna, Port Harcourt and Wari. Meanwhile, Mr. Abubakar has also been reacting to the swipe taken at him by the APC presidential candidate, Senator Bola Tinubu, who asked him to bow out, having run for the presidency successively without success. In response, Mr. Abubakar's media aide, Paul Ibe, says his principal is not running for the presidency in the 2023 election to engage in drug trafficking, money laundering, forgery and perjury. 
Mr. Ibe told Channels Television that his principal is only concerned about recovering Nigeria for the good of all. In his words, he, as Mr. Tiku, is running to make Nigeria better for Nigerians. He's running to use his experience to transform and recover Nigeria for the good of all. He's running to unify the country that has been divided by over seven years of a clueless and incompetent APC administration fostered in us by characters like Tinubu, he says. Well, speaking of Mr. Tinubu, the campaign trail of the presidential flag bearer of the All Progressives Congress, Senator Bola Tinubu, stopped over today in an all too familiar territory for him, a Lagos state, where he assured the people that he's capable of steering the country in the right direction if given the chance to lead. Senator Tinubu arrived at the Teslim Balogo Stadium Surulere venue of a mega campaign accompanied by his running mate, Senator Kashim Shatima. The Lagos State Governor, Babajide Sonwulu, Kano State Governor, Abdullahi Gantuje, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gwata Biamila, among other leaders of the party. As the country's February 2023 presidential election approaches, the campaign train of the flag bearer of the All Progressive Congress, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, appears to be leaving no stone unturned to ensure he emerges victorious at the polls. Party faithful started arriving as early as possible to beat the expected surge at the Teslim Balogu Stadium in Surulere, Lagos. Call it a coup for show or a carnival of a sort, and you won't be wrong, considering the activities lined up and performances on display as various supporting groups attempt to stamp their presence at the venue. This is more or less a homecoming for the APC presidential candidate who has served as Lagos State Governor for eight years. Your victory is our victory. We stand by you. He arrives to a tumultuous welcome in company of the leadership of the party at the state and national levels. This signaled the formal commencement of the rally. We can see this. In his welcome remark, Lagos State Governor. Babajide Sonwulu acknowledges the immense contribution of Bola Tinubu to the rebirth of modern Lagos. He's been the right man for the job at all levels. His reputation stands tall amongst his peers and will continue to drive from his wealth of experience in Lagos State in the past 23 years. This is a man that has fountain of knowledge. I can boldly say that he's the best man for the job. Other members of the campaign train also share similar sentiments, urging Lagosians to vote wisely. Charity begins at home, and I know that Lagosians are smart people who will not only support Tinubu because he is their own, but also because he has the capacity, ability, goodwill and charisma to serve Nigerians with fairness, equity, and justice. Ashiwaju Bola Tinubu is the president in waiting. He is the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Are we together? Yeah. Will you vote for him? Will you vote APC? Yes. The APC presidential flag bearer. Chief Bola Ahmed Tinubu thanked Lagosians for standing by him and solicits more of their support towards his election. We will continue a progressive government for this country where everybody will be included. You will not be forgotten in education, in health care, in employment you will not be forgotten we will do our best it is not easy at the starting point go and take your pvc and you vote apc do you love me do you love me do you love me go and take your apv 
This rally is afforded the All Progressives Congress presidential candidate to present himself as the right man for the job. It's now left for the people to decide to whom they owe their allegiance. Chris Lems, Channels Television News. In Abia State, one of the major promises of the Labour Party's governorship candidate, Mr. Alex Oti, is that his administration will revive the moribund industries in the state if elected in 2023. Mr. Oti made this pledge when he met with members of the Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce in the commercial city of Abba. During the meeting, Mr. Oti laid out his action plan before the business leaders while also given assurances that his administration will address the high level of unemployment in the state. Seated in this hall in Aba are members of the Aba Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture, as well as supporters and campaign council of the governorship candidate of the Labour Party in Abia State, Mr. Alex Oti. According to Mr. Oti, the purpose of the meeting is to reel out his campaign manifesto to the people, tackling insecurity, youth unemployment, and investing in women empowerment in the state is top on his agenda. We have a neighboring state here, not too far away from us. Benue State. Unemployment in that place is about 11%. Oshun State. Unemployment there is about 12%. But here we have 51% of our people who are not doing anything. And then you'll be wondering, ah, kidnapping is going up, banditry is going up. Insecurity has become the order of the day. Why not? Because we have not done what we should do. And the logic is simple. If I do not have a job, I am a candidate for any, level, any type of insecurity. He also promises to look into the state of the Port Akata Aba Expressway to ameliorate the hardship commuters face while plying the road. Some people's shops were destroyed, right? Yeah. Have they paid compensation? Yeah. One of the first things we will do within the first six months of our administration is to identify all of you and pay you proper compensation. And I believe that good governance requires that people are treated fairly. The president of the Aba Nigeria Association of Chambers of Commerce expresses dissatisfaction over the issue of multiple taxation faced by its members and harps on the need for accessible roads in the state. Contrarized goods that are supposed to come into the town by the aid of roads, the goods, and now get back to where they are coming from. You bring them in the night and they will not have roads until during the day. And those in the market, they will not load their vehicles. Those to take them back either to Aquaibum or Lagos. In fact, those from Lagos doesn't come to Abia anymore. Come March 2023, the people of Abia State will decide who takes over the governorship seat and the Labour Party governorship candidate says he is committed to reviving moribund industries, infrastructure development and strategic urban renewal in the state if elected into office. And out of security, the Sultan of Sokota is urging the new leadership of the Mieti Ala Cattle Breeders Association of Nigeria, Makban, to help the government find solutions to some national issues, including insecurity. While noting that the Fulani cattle breeders are peaceful people, he wonders why some of their children suddenly turned to banditry and kidnapping, a situation he wants the new executive to address urgently. The Sultan stated this during the inauguration of a new leadership of the group in Abuja. If we have not the history of Fulani movement from various parts of the world, definitely we will not have gone to the situation we are in now. So everybody knows Fulani moves from point A to B. He moves in the bushes, he moves in the towns, he moves everywhere. He intermarries with even with everybody. And we are peace loving. But how did we come to the situation we are in now? Yeah, we find our children who are Fulani's, but not all of them are Fulani's, being in the position of banditry, kidnappings, and whatever. What happened? When we meet with the executive after this swearing ceremony, 
we will discuss how do we really go into these issues, how do we resolve them, because it's high time we did. We cannot sit down and see this country going into fractures just because of certain things that were not done right. In part two, after the break, two policemen reportedly injured as truck crushes two vehicles in the convoy of the Adamawa State Governor, Amadou Fintiri. But that's in a moment. Stay with us. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The Nigerian Immigration Service intercepts 33 alleged illegal migrants from Chad and Togo in Odeda local government areas of Oku State. BDP presidential candidate Mr. Tiko Lubakar threatens to name and prosecute all thieves as he meets with business leaders in Lagos, replies his APC counterpart on his quest for the presidency. The Sultan of Sokoto challenges the new leadership of Mietiala Cattle Breeders Association of Nigeria to help government find solutions to banditry and kidnapping. A number of people fear dead as landslide triggered by heavy rains tears through the Italian island of Ischia. to Adamawa State where two policemen are reported to have been injured after a truck crashed into two vehicles in the convoy of the state governor Amadou Fintiri earlier today. According to an eyewitness, the incident happened shortly after the governor and some of his commissioners entered a black Mercedes bus at the end of a wedding at Aga Mosque in Yola, the state capital. It was gathered that the tipper suddenly ran into the direction of a governor's convoy at high speed, suggesting that the driver had lost control. Uh, the eyewitness adds that security operatives controlling traffic flow at the venue scampered in different directions to safety. But the governor came out unhurt and personally rebuked the driver before leaving the scene. And now to election management, a preliminary effort to clean up the voter register by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, saw over one million registered voters delisted from the register in September this year for various irregularities, including underage and double registrations. But with the recent publishing of the register, those concerns have again been raised with the electoral umpire saying it is confidence that more people who should not be in the register will be taken out in the ongoing cleanup, which is the second phase. Our next report looks at the process of the voter register cleanup. At every election circle, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, carries out massive voter registration to enable eligible citizens participate in the general elections. As in previous elections, the 2022 electoral law also provides that INEC carries out voter registration and cleanup for the forthcoming elections. The massive mobilization and turnout of citizens for registration also came with its challenges, as INEC announced in September that over 1.1 million people were delisted from the voter register owing to some irregularities such as underage and double registration. That preliminary cleanup by INEC was followed by public reactions to some of the discoveries in the register. What we have done is to subject the preliminary register of voters to Nigerians so that Nigerians can also help the commission clean up the voters register further. So many Nigerians are visiting our website and also making their claims and also raising objections on the website. All these things will be brought back to the commission for the commission to have a final say in relation to uh, what, what has been done and in relation to uh, what has not been done. However, there are restrictions in the process of reporting irregularities in the voter register. If you make an objection on an underage 
an, um, a non-Nigerian or, or multiple registrants, first you need to provide proof of claim. And there are documents like birth certificates, like national ID, um, as well as death certificates. For heaven's sake, someone's making that kind of objection. Where is the person going to obtain that claim from? That process is not very easy. It's not even clearly defined. The electorates, the voters, don't really know how the procedure, they, they don't know the procedure to follow to be able to make that claim. Uh, and I think that is one area that needs to be revisited. Political parties and civil society organizations agree on the need to reform the voter register cleanup process. The concern that has been expressed by people, and I think INEC being a responsible body that has demonstrated capacity and willingness to deliver a credible election in 2023 and beyond, must revisit that. This is an opportunity for reforms in the next electoral reform process, that we have to rejig this entire process. There are currently over 93.5 million registered voters for the 2023 general elections in Nigeria. However, to ensure that only eligible voters make their way into the country's voter register in all future elections, more definitely needs to be done with the cleanup process. And to governance, River State Governor Yesum Wike has taken a swipe at his predecessor, Chibuke Amechi, for reportedly describing the project's inauguration ceremonies in the state as noise-making. Governor Wike, who was speaking during the inauguration of a road in Obiakwa local government area, challenged the former governor to identify any project he attracted to River State while serving as governor and minister. It's yet another day of project commissioning in River State, and the latest is this newly constructed road in Obiakwa local government area. It's constructed to open up new layout in the two neighboring communities that are fast emerging metropolis in the popular room of Koro clan. The appreciation by the benefiting communities are communicated through cultural performances and in words. We thank the government of River State for helping us recover some of our land that had been acquired by the federal government, in fact, the colonial government, on which they built Air Force Base, which was then called Port Harcourt Aerodrome, and on which they built also the Bori Camp, the Port Harcourt Barracks. He takes a moment to recommit himself to the ideals of good governance and then takes a swipe at his predecessor, Roti Miyamichi, for reportedly criticizing the ceremonies for his project inauguration as noise making. I hear a few days ago, the former governor of River State said that he did a lot of roads and flyovers in Port Agot. He did not make noise. What is all about the noise? I didn't see the flyover as he did. If he did the roads, mention the roads. He said, our government will not have money to pay salaries, not to talk about doing a project. So today, by the grace of God, we are not only paying salaries, we are not only paying pensioners, we're not only paying gratuities that he did not pay, we have gone beyond to carry out projects which he failed to carry out. Unlike in previous inauguration ceremonies, Governor Wiki is to personally commission this project, which incidentally is in his local government area. It's expected that this road will contribute to the socio-economic advancement of the benefiting communities. And in a swift response, the River State chapter of the All Progressives Congress, APC, has reacted to Governor Yusuf Wicke's criticism of the former governor of the state, Mr. Chibuke Amichi, accusing him of failing to execute project while serving as chief executive of the state and minister. A statement by the party's spokesperson in the state, Darlington Wauju, explains that there is no way Mr. Meiji can engage in any media exchanges with the governor 
as he believes that Nigerians no longer take seriously most of the comments that come from the governor. Ms. Awaju adds that the former governor of River State had to the credit of his administration five flyover projects constructed in the state during his tenure. The statement adds that these projects, like others by his administration, were done with utmost regard for due process as they went through competitive bidding processes with premium standards delivered in the best interest of the river's people. And to fight against corruption, the Office of the Presidential Amnesty Program says an audit of its payroll has uncovered fraudulent practice of ex-agitators who are beneficiaries of monthly stipends having multiple bank accounts. And so as part of steps to check this, the agency is moving to sanitize the payroll with the verification of all ex-agitators, which will commence on the 30th in all the Niger Delta states. He has initiated plans to renegotiate the existing contracts with vendors. In the process, he has been able to save over 1.5 billion naira. He has shown greater commitment to the core values of the program, hence was able to extract promises and commitments from sister agencies and stakeholders. For instance, the head of service has promised to absorb 350 agitators into the federal civil service once the opportunity presents itself. General Ndiomo has also initiated internal and external audits of each database the auditors have uncovered monumental frauds, especially in the payment of stipends and other sundry funds, where an individual is receiving stipends meant for 33 persons through fraudulent means. Hence, the proactive interim administrator has ordered for the immediate verification process of all delegates to be carried out next week without further delay. Delegates are to be rest assured that whoever that is verified will be paid immediately. 3,328, oh, that's the number of convictions. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, says it has recorded between January and November. The EFCC made this known during a financial crimes reporting workshop in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, to intimate journalists on some of the activities of the agency. Many of you may be aware of the strikes we have recorded in the fight against corruption, especially in the area of asset recovery. Two days ago, we got the court to forfeit to the Nigerian government a sum of 755 million naira, which was recovered from a former Attorney General of the Federation and three luxury, luxury, luxury properties. One million of naira recovered from Colonel Bello Fagine, a former aide to this world national security advisor, Sambo Kasuki. We also secured the interim for future of 40 assets in Nigeria United States of America, London, and Dubai, belonging to former Deputy Senate President E.K. Boramani. Two weeks earlier, under court issued a final for future order of two properties stated in Abuja belonging to design Alison Madeke, former Minister of Petroleum Resources. These are just a few of the assets covered for federal government of Nigeria this year alone. In the area of prosecution of cases in court, we are also making progress despite the antics of some defendants to delay trials from January to from January to 18 November 2022. What's the labor matters now? Again, members of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, have called on the federal government to stop treating university lecturers like casual workers. Speaking during separate protests in the state capitals of Sokoto, Adamawa and Niger, the lecturers also called on the government to stop using starvation to fight ASU members and urged the president to honor the agreement which the government signed with the national leadership of the union. They have been telling us we are the leaders of tomorrow, students. But up to now, that tomorrow has never reached. Ah! Yeah! 
Members of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, in the Usman Danfodo University, Sokoto State, led by the chairman of the chapter, Nuruddin Al Mustafa, in a procession. They are here to submit a demand letter to the president through the vice chancellor of the university, calling for immediate payment of their withheld salary by the federal government. The strange policy adopted by the Minister of Labor, known as Pro Rata, in the payment of October salaries, in which our members are referred to as casual workers and under your watch was the worst blow to Nigerian public universities. Meanwhile, in Mina, the Niger State capital, the lecturers at the Federal University of Technology in Mina are also demanding action on the matter. They say the half salary paid to them is an insult to the academia, the university and the Nigerian state, and that FUT Mina has resolved to reject what they term the reduction of Nigerian scholars to casual workers. We know that people have been appealing to us that we shouldn't shut down the university system again. So in our own wisdom and thinking, we decided, okay, go, let us make a statement that we are not comfortable with our situation. That people out there should know that what federal government is doing to academics in Nigeria, we that are directly affected, we are not comfortable with it. So Lecturers from the Modibo Adama University, Yola, the Adamawa state capital, are not left out in the nationwide protests. Majority of the people in government today are a product of free education in Nigeria. What they deliberately refuse to extend such gifts to the children of the masses. They are comfortably siphoning our common resources to educate their children in private and foreign universities while superintending the conversion of public universities to a glorified secondary school. The lecturers say they will do everything possible to resist an attempt by the government to make them resort to transferring their aggression to innocent students. And more stories now. Organizers of the Nigeria Media Merit Award, NMMA, have held a round table for media leaders on the role of the industry in the country's development. But the round table, which had in attendance media professionals and veterans, is a prelude to the 2022 Grand Media Excellence Presentation Program holding tomorrow in Lagos. It's the weekend marking the 30th anniversary of the Nigeria Media Merit Award, which focuses on fostering media excellence. Part of the prelude to the celebration and the 2022 award ceremony is this Media Leaders Roundtable for practitioners and veterans in the industry. This year's topic, which focuses on media's role in national development, is given a special treatment by the keynote speaker. If media is silent on an issue, that then that media is not behaving to the expectation that the media must talk. That is it possible for the media to be objective? Are there influences, are there pressures, are there considerations that will make media not think more of a nation and less of those issues and the pressures after them? Other discussions give various dimensions to the topic from the historical to the interplay of ethnicity. There are similarities between all ethnic groups in this country. We are not getting such stories in the media. Rather, what we are getting are stories of differences. We need stories that will provide us solutions to our challenges, not just lamentation and condemnation. That this once vibrant industry has become the stuff of media history must be painful to all of us, professionals and non-professionals alike. Without the news magazines, uh, mass media have lost their unique characteristics of vibrancy, intrepidity, daring, courage, and even iconoclasm. For the chairman, board of trustees of NMMA, the issues raised by these professionals portray the media's current realities. These, therefore, are the issues which the media in Nigeria today has to deal with, and we hope that this kind of enlightenment 
to help us to understand why the Nigerian Media Merit Award is bent on bringing together and building the capacity so that we can see what the problem is and then what the solution can be. The 30th NMMA Grand Media Excellence Presentation Program will round off the week-long event in Lagos. Elsewhere, some other media professionals have been discussing ways of reinventing television for Nigeria's political, economic and security advancement. According to them, national security has moved beyond dislodging terrorists in certain areas of a country to ensuring that television or radio broadcasts promote peace in the nation. Well, they made their views known at the 2022 World Television Day in Lagos. Television remains a major tool in informing, channeling and affecting public opinion, having an undoubtable presence and influence on world politics. From across Lagos, union members in Nigeria's radio and television industry gather to examine the medium's critical role in the country's political, economic and security advancement. For the guest speaker, national security goes beyond driving out terrorists. It's no longer about repelling of military attacks against your own country, our, our own country. And section 131, 131 of that uh, sixth edition said something like, sensationalism shall be avoided by refraining from speculations statements, details or exaggerations that could create mass panic and hysteria. Still on national security, the view of the chairman and CEO of Channels Media Group, Mr. John Mummer, who is represented by the station's assistant general manager operations, Mr. Kinsley Uranta. For him, television must not promote acts of terrorism. No doubt we should report issues as they occur, but in my view, we should be careful not to inadvertently give the bad guys undue oxygen and publicity. My thinking is that we must celebrate the tremendous success recorded by our gallant Nigerian forces. That way, we boost their morale, give them more energy, and snuff out life from the bad guys. The issue of funding especially for state and federal TV stations, must be taken more seriously. The major thing concerning the advertisers is that they don't pay as at when due. And that is the major problem we have with them. If they, if they pay, if it is pay as you go, then the stations will have enough money to run their stations. But in a station where um, you want to take it on credit for three months, where is that being practiced? While social media has become a major competitor against good old television, the impact of the magic box in society's development and transformation cannot be wished away. The United Nations is promising continued support to Nigeria in its efforts to implement the Integrated National Financing Framework, INFF. Well, the framework is a country-owned planning and delivery tool that provides a structure for finance and especially sustainable development at the national level. The resident representative of the UN Development Program, Mr. Mohammed Yahya, said this during the INFF dialogue hosted by Channels Television. The, the costing of the SDGs, uh, and this year we have. A it's a conversation on the Integrated National Finance and Framework (INFF) hosted by Channels Television in partnership with the Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Sustainable Development Goals, United Nations Development Project (UNDP), and the European Union. Nigeria committed itself even more intently to a number of the goals about moderated eight of them. by channels TV and Komao Peogun Yusuf. The conversation centers on the challenges and achievements of the framework, which is designed to close the funding gap for the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. So much changed after the COVID pandemic. So for us, it was quite 
fortuitous timing that we undertook the process while also grappling with the implications of COVID um, and now with the implications of the war in Ukraine. So the idea is to say, what have we been doing? What has worked? Where are there opportunities for revenue, for tapping into remittances, for attracting foreign direct investments? Um, and how do we ensure that all stakeholders are at the table? To achieve the SDGs, we need to shift from funding sustainable development to financing sustainable development. That means tapping, you know, the uh, private capital and then bringing it into uh, financing sustainable development. You know, However, you know, there's concern over the government's expenditure. Only about 23 to 24 dollars out of 100 is available for capital expenditure. And when you strip down that capital expenditure, what you're going to understand is that the bulk of it is, again, largely financing government. Um, it's fleets of cars, it's all of the paraphernalia of government. What's actually going through to development, and this is infrastructure, it's education, it's health care, is less than six dollars. Uh, Meanwhile, completed the, the costing of the SDGs, more support to Nigeria. Uh, and this year we have uh, added um, an additional funding uh, of 1.7 million euros that is implemented through UNDP uh, for the, the completion and the launch of, of the INFF strategy. For UNDP specifically, we'll be focusing mainly on the issue of climate and climate change and how that impacts livelihood, and the EU also is a priority for them. Uh, and we'll also be focusing issues around inclusivity, uh, specifically uh, it relates to inequality. Stakeholders believe for Nigeria to achieve its targets for the Sustainable Development Goals, all hands must be on deck and the government must be deliberate in its policy implementation. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. 198 Niger Delta youths and women are the latest beneficiaries of the empowerment drive of the Niger Delta Development Commission as they are trained in agency banking. The training carried out in conjunction with the Empowerment Support Initiative, ESI, a non-governmental organization as part of NDDC's skill acquisition programs in the region. Speaking at the graduation ceremony, the NDDC Acting Managing Director says the program is part of the federal government's plan to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. For seven years, the partnership between the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, and the Empowerment Support Initiative, ESI, a non-governmental organization, has provided assistance to indigent youths and women of the Niger Delta through skill acquisition programs and other entrepreneurial development schemes. <laughs> It's the seventh graduation ceremony in Port Akat, the River State capital, and 198 youth and women trained in agency banking and equipped with starter packs are set to kick off their businesses. What we have done is not just training, it's actually making you people entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, not to know. You will not have somebody eventually who you will be paying salaries. The Board of Directors of Empowerment Support Initiative believes its collaboration with NDDC is the driving force behind the many successes recorded over the years. They have been there. They have been steadfast in their social responsibilities to the region. And so the project has been sustained for seven years. For beneficiaries, it's a life-changing opportunity. With this empowerment now, uh, I think they have relieved a burden, and with this now, I can start up, you know, life again. Um, I'm very excited because it's to give me a, like an opportunity to be useful in the society. So I'm very, very happy. Owing to the social and economic impact of the scheme, the NDDC is making further commitment to the partnership. With things like this, programs like this. Criminality in the Niger Delta region will be reduced. With sort of this sort of programs, we also reduce unemployment drastically, and that is why the NDDC was created. The commission hopes to capture more youth and women under the entrepreneurial development scheme to acquire meaningful and self-sustaining skills 
that will improve their lives, support their families and communities, and thus reduce criminality in the Niger Delta region. From the micro to the macro, Willebong is here with more business stories on the news at 10. Thanks, Kayode. Nigeria's forex reserves have declined further by $10.97 million week on week to $37.18 billion, the lowest level since September 2021. And that's according to latest data from the central bank's website as at November the 24th. Analysts suspect, however, that the FX liquidity issues will remain over the short to medium term in the absence of any positive signal that shows an improvement in the FX supply compared to pre-pandemic levels. Meanwhile, forex market trading activity at the FMDQ exchange was mostly positive this week as the total turnover of transactions carried out at the FX port forwards and futures markets rose by 47.31% week on week to $728.97 million. A breakdown of trading results shows that as at November the 25th, total value of transactions at the FX port market, that's the IND window, climbed by 19.33% to $525.76 million. While transactions at the FX derivatives market jumped by 274.72% to over $203 million. However, the Naira's value fell further by 0.02% to 444 Naira. 53 cobo against the dollar at the NAFEX window when compared to last week's close of 444 Naira 42 cobo. This week, the dominance of the bulls ensured the local boss closed the week on a very strong note as the benchmark index recorded gains in all trading sessions following demand for bellwether stocks. Accordingly, the all-share index advanced by 6.88% week-on-week to close at 47,554.34 points. Investors' interest in Etel Africa, Dangote Cement, MTN Nigeria, Boa Cement, Boa Foods and Nigerian Breweries spurred the positive performance. Consequently, the month-to-date and year-to-date returns advanced to 8.5 and 11.3 percent, respectively, both in positive territory. Activity levels mirrored the market's broad gauge as trading volume and value increased by 2.5 percent and 77 percent week-on-week, respectively. Sectoral performance was mostly positive following gains in the industrial goods, insurance, banking and consumer goods indexes. But on the flip side, the oil and gas index was the sole loser of the week. Nigerian breweries topped the gainers chart for the week while Nestle Nigeria led the decliners. The trio of transnational corporation Ico Insurance and Zenith Bank contributed 27.35% and 7.76% to the total volume and value traded in the week. Similarly, at the unlisted securities market, the NASD OTC Securities Exchange Index closed the fourth week in November positive. The index rose marginally by 0.01% as 5 million naira was added to the market cap. However, volume and value decreased. Volume traded for the week stood at 1.43 million units, while value fell by 63.92% to 37.49 million naira. UBN property still retaining its leading position from last week, topped the gainers chart. There were no decliners for the week. In terms of volume, traded UBN property and Friesland Campina Wamco Nigeria were among top five stocks traded this week. And that's it on business news. It's back to Coyote for the news, for the rest of the news at 10. Thanks a lot, Will. And now for the latest in the world of sports. St. Xavier's School Ikoi Endowment Fund has hosted 2022 Lagos Kids Mini Marathon at the Eco Atlantic in Victoria Island. The inter-school competition themed Active Kids Rock was created to inspire kids to run for a charity and make being physically active a lifestyle. The event attracted over 2,000 children. 
Promoting fitness and wellness among Nigerian children comes into focus at the 2022 Lagos Kids Mini Marathon. The event, organized by St. Xavier's School Ikoi Endowment Fund, seeks to inspire kids to be more physically active from an early age. Kiton Omodaya emerges winner in the boys' 1.5-kilometer race, while Maria Mukhtar wins the girls' category. Both participated in the 6 to 8 years race. For the 3-kilometer race, Henry Okafor and Bushope Ambodi reign supreme in the 9 to 12 years category. I'm just going to um, probably rest and then um, when I grow up, I want to be um, an Olympian. It helps for exercise and to play with your friends. And I got a medal, all of us. Actually, this marathon helps us get fit and if there's any coming event again like this, we'll be ready and we actually win first place. It means um, getting fit and getting ready for upcoming events, like if I have to run away from something. So it will keep my speed and all that stuff. Part of the proceeds from the mini marathon will be used to support social and developmental causes. St. Saviour School is a school that believes in excellence and our excellence is not just in terms of academics or sports or music, sports is also important. We're hoping from this we will have children who will go on to be world-class international marathoners. Come to School at One of is a charity that we've been supporting for the past, since we started the mini marathon in 2017, so we're doing that, we're still doing so. Part of our proceeds goes to them. Part of the, the rest of our proceeds goes into the endowment funds. Like one of the sponsors said, bringing them to a place like this is showing them a part of Lagos they've not seen before and the opportunity for them to aspire. St. Xavier School Endowment Fund promises to sustain the event while expecting bigger participation in subsequent races. Congratulations, boys. Well, that's good to see. And now to a competition for an older age category, the 2022 World Cup, where France have become the first team to qualify for the last 16 of the Qatar 2022 World Cup as Kylian Mbappé's double sent the defending champions to a 2-1 win over Denmark. Mbappé scored the first of his two poacher-like efforts when converting a cross from Theo Hernandez on 61 minutes. Denmark leveled seven minutes later when Andreas Christensen headed home from a Christian Eriksen corner. The Paris Saint-Germain forward again showed sharp predatory skills to bundle home an Antoine Griezmann cross with four minutes remaining. And Lionel Messi has scored a superb goal to help reignite Argentina's World Cup campaign in a 2-0 victory over Mexico. Well, Messi rifled home a low shot on 64 minutes before rising star Enzo Fernandez curled home an 87th minute strike to seal three points at Doha's Lucille Stadium. Well, the victory moves Argentina second in the group with three points, one behind next opponents Poland and above Saudi Arabia on goal difference. Well, Mexico prop up the group with a solitary point. Barcelona forward Robert Lewandowski has scored the first World Cup goal of his prolific career as Poland defeated Saudi Arabia 2-0 to bust their bubble following the team's giant killing act against Argentina. Piotr Zelensky opened the scoring six minutes before halftime as Lewandowski reacted quickest to cut back to his teammate who slammed home from six yards out. Poland goalkeeper Wojciech Szczesny saved a penalty from Salim al Dosari on the stroke of half-time before Lewandowski capitalized on a defensive error in the second minute to seal the three points. Well, the United Nations World Tourism Organization and the Kingdom of Morocco have signed an agreement on a digital future program in Africa, which is targeted at encouraging young people to be a part of a tourism industry. And one of the first steps is through a technology startup competition. The UNWTO says it hopes the pilot project in Morocco will be replicated in other parts of Africa sooner than later. But this came as a 107. 
17th UNWTO Executive Council meeting continued in Marrakesh today, breaking into working groups to drill down on issues affecting the industry in Africa and around the world. The policy debate focused on how to help SMEs and how to recruit and retain talent and by doing so transform tourism. The digitization of the African and global tourism industry will sustain the industry as other areas of importance, according to the panelists, will include good salary structure for workers, training and reward. And further by $10.97 million week on week to $37.18 billion, the lowest level since September 2021. And that's according to latest data from the central bank's website as at November the 24th. Analysts suspect, however, that the FX liquidity issues will remain over the short to medium term in the absence of any positive signal that shows an improvement in the FX supply compared to pre-pandemic levels. Meanwhile, forex market trading activity at the FMDQ exchange was mostly positive this week as the total turnover of transactions carried out at the FX port forwards and futures markets rose by 47.31% week on week to $728.97 million. A breakdown of trading results shows that as at November the 25th, total value of transactions at the FX port market, that's the IND window, climbed by 19.33% to $525.76 million. While transactions at the FX derivatives market jumped by 274.72% to over $203 million. However, the Naira's value fell further by 0.02% to 444 Naira. 53 cobo against the dollar at the NAFEX window when compared to last week's close of 444 Naira 42 cobo. This week, the dominance of the bulls ensured the local boss closed the week on a very strong note as the benchmark index recorded gains in all trading sessions following demand for bellwether stocks. Accordingly, the all-share index advanced by 6.88% week-on-week to close at 47,554.34 points. Investors' interest in Etel Africa, Dangote Cement, MTN Nigeria, Boa Cement, Boa Foods and Nigerian Breweries spurred the positive performance. Consequently, the month to date and year to date returns advanced to 8.5 and 11.3 percent respectively, both in positive territory. Activity levels mirrored the market's broad gauge as trading volume and value increased by 2.5 percent and 77 percent week on week respectively. Sectoral performance was mostly positive following gains in the industrial goods, insurance, banking and consumer goods indexes. But on the flip side, the oil and gas index was the sole loser of the week. Nigerian breweries topped the gainers chart for the week while Nestle Nigeria led the decliners. The trio of transnational corporation Ico Insurance and Zenith Bank contributed 27.35% and 7.76% to the total volume and value traded in the week. Similarly, at the unlisted securities market, the NASD OTC Securities Exchange Index closed the fourth week in November positive. The index rose marginally by 0.01% as 5 million naira was added to the market cap. However, volume and value decreased. Volume traded for the week stood at 1.43 million units, while value fell by 63.92% to 37.49 million naira. UBN property still retaining its leading position from last week, topped the gainers chart. There were no decliners for the week. In terms of volume, traded UBN property and Friesland Campina Wamco Nigeria were among top five stocks traded this week. And that's it on business news. It's back to Coyote for the news, for the rest of the news at 10. Thanks a lot, Will. And now for the latest in the world of sports. St. Xavier's School Ikoi Endowment Fund has hosted 2022 Lagos Kids Mini Marathon at the Eco Atlantic in Victoria Island. The inter-school competition themed Active Kids Rock was created to inspire kids to run for a charity and make being physically active a lifestyle. 
The event attracted over 2,000 children. Promoting fitness and wellness among Nigerian children comes into focus at the 2022 Lagos Kids Mini Marathon. The event, organized by St. Xavier's School Ikoi Endowment Fund, seeks to inspire kids to be more physically active from an early age. Kiton Omodaya emerges winner in the boys' 1.5-kilometer race, while Maria Mukhtar wins the girls' category. Both participated in the 6 to 8 years race. For the three-kilometer race, Henry Okafor and Bushope Ambodi reign supreme in the 9 to 12 years category. I'm just going to um, probably rest and then um, when I grow up, I want to be um, an Olympian. It helps for exercise and to play with your friends. And I got a medal, all of us. Actually, this marathon helps us get fit and if there's any coming event again like this, we'll be ready and we actually win first place. It means um, getting fit and getting ready for upcoming events, like if I have to run away from something, so it will keep my speed and all that stuff. <laughs> Part of the proceeds from the mini marathon will be used to support social and developmental causes. St. Saviour School is a school that believes in excellence and our excellence is not just in terms of academics or sports or music, sports is also important. We're hoping from this we will have children who will go on to be world-class international marathoners. Come to School at One of is a charity that we've been supporting for the past, since we started the mini marathon in 2017, so we're doing that, we're still doing so. Part of our proceeds goes to them. Part of the, the rest of our proceeds goes into the endowment funds. Like one of the sponsors said, bringing them to a place like this is showing them a part of Lagos they've not seen before and the opportunity for them to aspire. St. Xavier School Endowment Fund promises to sustain the event while expecting bigger participation in subsequent races. Congratulations, boys. Oh, that's good to see. And now to a competition for an older age category, the 2022 World Cup, where France have become the first team to qualify for the last 16 of the Qatar 2022 World Cup as Kylian Mbappé's double sent the defending champions to a 2-1 win over Denmark. Mbappé scored the first of his two poacher-like efforts when converting a cross from Theo Hernandez on 61 minutes. Denmark leveled seven minutes later when Andreas Christensen headed home from a Christian Eriksen corner. The Paris Saint-Germain forward again showed sharp predatory skills to bundle home an Antoine Griezmann cross with four minutes remaining. And Lionel Messi has scored a superb goal to help reignite Argentina's World Cup campaign in a 2-0 victory over Mexico. Well, Messi rifled home a low shot on 64 minutes before rising star Enzo Fernandez curled home an 87th minute strike to seal three points at Doha's Lucille Stadium. Well, the victory moves Argentina second in the group with three points, one behind next opponents Poland and above Saudi Arabia on goal difference. Well, Mexico prop up the group with a solitary point. Barcelona forward Robert Lewandowski has scored the first World Cup goal of his prolific career as Poland defeated Saudi Arabia 2-0 to bust their bubble following the team's giant killing act against Argentina. Piotr Zelensky opened the scoring six minutes before halftime as Lewandowski reacted quickest to cut back to his teammate who slammed home from six yards out. Poland goalkeeper Wojciech Szczesny saved a penalty from Salim al Dosari on the stroke of half-time before Lewandowski capitalized on a defensive error in the second minute to seal the three points. Well, the United Nations World Tourism Organization and the Kingdom of Morocco have signed an agreement on a digital future program in Africa, which is targeted at encouraging young people to be a part of a tourism industry. And one of the first steps is through a technology startup competition. The UNWTO says it hopes the pilot project in Morocco will be replicated in other parts of Africa sooner than later. 
But this came as a 117th UNW2 Executive Council meeting continued in Marrakesh today, breaking into working groups to drill down on issues affecting the industry in Africa and around the world. And the policy debate focused on how to help SMEs and how to recruit and retain talent and by doing so, transform tourism. The digitization of the African and global tourism industry will sustain the industry as other areas of importance, according to the panelists, will include good salary structure for workers, training and reward. And on a rather sad note, a number of people are feared to have been killed after a mudslide triggered by heavy rain swept away homes on the island of Ischia near Naples. The torrent of mud and debris dislodged trees, engulfed buildings and dragged cars into the sea as it reached the coast early today. The body of a woman was reported to have been found under the mud and several other people are still missing. A bad weather is said to be hampering efforts to reach the island as the mayor of Laco Meno, which is one of the island's towns, said dozens of families are still cut off and a number of buildings had collapsed. Several people are also reportedly stuck inside a hotel on the island. Heavy rains have been battering Campania and uh, other surrounding regions as a weather warning for rainfall and strong winds is in place until Sunday. Local authorities are urging residents to stay home to avoid hindering emergency services. And the main news again. The Nigerian Immigration Service today intercepted 33 alleged migrants from the Republic of Chad and Togo in Odeda local government area of Ogu State. The State Controller of Immigration, Yakubu Jibrin, said the suspects were without valid travel documents and no means of livelihood. Also today, PDP presidential candidate Mr. Artiko Abubakar threatened to name, shame and prosecute all thieves as he met with business leaders in Lagos. He equally replied his APC counterpart on his quest for the presidency, saying he is running to recover Nigeria for the good of all. And that's the news at 10 for tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kairo Kikulu. Good night.